good to see you here. This is a special afternoon that uh, we have baptismal service and just really looking forward to what the Lord has for us. I just want to share a few thoughts before we actually enter into the baptism itself. Very few people have any experience of salvation that is similar to Saul of Tarsus, as you would imagine. You know the story, right? He got saved while he was on a mission to literally, if he could, stamp out Christianity. And as a Jewish Pharisee, he was zealous to obliterate the early church. But I don't know if you remember from John 16 that we looked at this morning in verse 2. It says that they will not only throw you out of the synagogue, but they will think that they are doing God a service by killing you. And this is an apt uh, expression of Saul of Tarsus. He thought he was holy for serving God that way. And, of course, we know from his own testimony that he was doing it in total ignorance because, like most of the Jewish leaders, he had rejected Jesus of Nazareth as the Son of God, as Israel's Messiah. About three days after he got saved uh, or met the Lord, Saul of Tarsus was baptized. We read about it in Acts chapter 9. And I think that Saul's baptism and his salvation is really symbolic. His salvation is symbolic of everything that water baptism represents. And I want to share that with you. Uh, I would have you turn, perhaps, first of all, to the book of 1 Peter. And in 1 Peter chapter 3, we read some just really hard to understand words regarding baptism in this chapter, but eventually we'll get to unpack a little bit of this in the minutes that we have together. And in 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 19, here is what we read. Speaking of Jesus, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That, again, is a very difficult, especially the 21st verse, to understand, but we'll get to that in a moment. What I wanted to begin with, actually, is uh, a verse in Galatians where Paul is actually referring to his testimony. And uh, he says in Galatians 1.23 that the churches of Judea, when they heard that he who persecuted us in times past now preaches the faith which he once destroyed, that illustrates to us what salvation really entails and baptism symbolizes. And first of all, Salvation entails a, 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 to be transformed. That's what we see in Paul's life. By the way, the word transformed in the New Testament appears a couple of times by that very word. Other times, there's other words that uh, are used. For example, in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18, it says, With open face we behold, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, and we are changed, literally transformed, same word, metamorphosis. We get that word metamorphosis from that word translated changed or transformed. We are changed, transformed from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of the Lord. When a person is born again, they are transformed. They are changed, and, and by the way, that word 
metamorpho actually means to be changed from one form into another, a totally different form. And so when a believer gets saved, like Paul, like Saul, they are changed into another form. When Saul met Jesus, he was absolutely transformed. As we read there in Galatians 1.23, he was changed from a blasphemer to a believer. He was changed from being a rebel against the Lord to being receptive of the Lord. He was changed from a persecutor of believers to a preacher of the gospel. He was changed, transformed from a sinner to a saint. That's what happens when a person is saved by the grace of God. They become transformed. And their position before God completely changes. But that has to be lived out practically in a daily way. And that requires that a believer, once saved, is continually, absolutely surrendering to the Lord and at the same time, constantly, step by step, depending upon the Lord. That equals a transformed life every day. But there's a second thing that uh, I believe Saul's salvation illustrates and all it's tied up with baptism. Not only transformed, but he was transferred. In the book of Colossians, Paul says that when you are born again, when you're saved, you are transferred, translated out of the power of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. You're translated out of the kingdom of darkness, you might say, into the kingdom of light. You're translated out of Satan's kingdom into God's kingdom. And baptism is very crucial in picturing this transferal. And I want you to see why. First of all, Water baptism really symbolizes the baptism by the Holy Spirit. In the book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 12, we are told that we are all baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ, into one body, and we're all made to drink into one spirit. That's really a picture of, a, an explanation of what the baptism of the Holy Spirit really is. The Holy Spirit, when a person gets saved, he separates that person from sin, and he joins that individual for the first time to Christ. He unites that person to Christ, and the relationship is so close that two, the, the, the person and Christ become one. That's what the Bible teaches. Two become one. And so baptism, water baptism, pictures that union, that uniting, that joining of a person with Jesus. And we're identified with him, pictured in the going under the water, coming up out of the water, pictured that uh, we're identified with Christ's death to sin, and uh, also the burial of the old man, the old life that we used to live, and coming out anointed with resurrection power of a new heavenly life that we now have to live, baptized. All into one body, all made to drink of one spirit, one baptism, but there's two directions there. There is into Christ, joined to him, and then filled with his spirit, made to drink of one's spirit. That is the spirit's anointing and filling of the believer's life. That's all part of being transferred into his kingdom. But there's a second aspect that I've had you turn to 1 Peter 3 to try to bring this out. You're no longer, if you're saved, you are no longer, as I've already said, a member of Satan's kingdom. You have been transferred into God's kingdom. In verse 19 of 1 Peter chapter 3, talking about Jesus, the Messiah, who suffered on that cross for our sins, that he might bring us to God, put to death in the flesh, it says, but quickened by the Spirit, and quickened by the Spirit, Jesus, that is brought to life by the Spirit, Jesus 
went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Now that is that is an amazing verse that often gets skipped over and uh, not explained. But I want to explain a little bit of it in just uh, the few minutes we have. What I believe that's telling us, that 19th verse, is that between Jesus' death and resurrection, he went to the underworld. He went to the place of departed spirits. And he announced his victory over them. And he officially sealed the doom of these evil spirits for all eternity by that announcement. And I think that's why Peter ends this chapter with verse 22, in which he says, who is gone into heaven, that's the ascension, and is on the right hand of God, that's in his enthronement, being made, uh, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. He has announced his eternal victory over them, and that's why he's seated on that throne of God. That's the announcement. And baptism is analogous to that. And I want to show you how. That's what verse 21, I think, is about. Because it says, the light figure, whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. In other words, baptism does not save from sin. It does not cleanse the flesh. But here's what baptism does. It reflects salvation in that, notice, it is the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, the word answer there in verse 21 is a word that means a pledge or an oath. A pledge or an oath. And the word conscience in verse 21 is not referring to that inner voice that every human being has, but rather the conscience in that verse refers to a settled attitude of loyalty to Jesus. It's a reference to the transferred life from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of Christ. And obviously, baptism doesn't produce salvation, but what it's saying here is that baptism is the outward evidence, is the evidence of a heart decision, a loyal pledge, a loyalty pledge that you're all in, that you're completely uh, uh, allegiant, uh, 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 allegiant, your complete allegiance and your total loyalty is to Jesus, that you've decided. And water baptism, really, in a sense, is a part of spiritual warfare. It's a part of spiritual warfare in that, as I said, it is analogous to Jesus going to the underworld and announcing his victory over them and their eternal doom. And water baptism is like a reiteration, a reminder to the evil spirits of Christ's victory over them and their eternal doom. When you go in the water and come up out of the water, it's, again, a reiteration of verse 19. Jesus sealed your doom. It's a wonderful thing when you understand the meaning of baptism. It has nothing to do with, with uh, you obtaining salvation, because salvation is not obtained by any moral perfection, and that's why it can't be lost by moral imperfection. It's all of grace, and it's all because of Jesus. And baptism pictures all of this, and I'm sure more that I don't even know about and that I couldn't even put into words. But this, this is enough to see how serious baptism is. And, you know, in, in many countries, when people get baptized, it's like that's it. They are totally done. They parade them through the, the main street of the, of the town or the village in white robes. And it's, it's just a, a, a marker. We're done with the old life. We are now transferred and transformed. And that's really what baptism ought to mean to us. 
as we see it today.